the theories that, that motivate the particular sciences all begin from philosophical assumptions, mostly centuries old, and mostly unexamined within those sciences. Uh, in, in economics, the myth of the rational man, for example. And uh, so philosophy probes those very issues, those deeper ones. I think we can part the clouds and see how the universe works. We just shouldn't get too attached to the picture at any given point in time. Uh, because uh, one of the things we know inductively is that it's always wrong. Uh, uh, it's always wrong either in being incomplete uh, or being based on a fundamentally uh, 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 a misleading model, uh, uh, even as it enables us to capture some of what we're interested in, it almost never uh, survives further sustained scrutiny uh, in, uh, you know, lengthy periods of time anyway. So, you know, the models that were developed uh, and that were developed in contact with reality, indeed in contact with data, indeed in contact with systematized data, indeed in contact with theorized data, all those models that were developed in, uh, the, by the ancient Greeks, uh, by the Renaissance uh, uh, early modern scientists. All of those models have been shown uh, subsequently to mm. have been uh, misleading or incomplete in some way. If your goal is to believe what is true, then you're looking at the rules of epistemic rationality. That is to say, the kind of rationality and rational reasoning that is most likely to lead you to true beliefs and lead you away from false beliefs. If your goal is to live well, it's a lot more complicated. If your goal is to desire the things that are best to desire, it's also a lot more complicated. But the general point is that when somebody says, oh, so-and-so is too rational, she thinks too much, what they really mean is that that person is more likely to use an analytic approach to solving problems even when that analytic approach is not a good idea. Because even when it's not the kind of thing that an analytic approach is likely to be most efficient for. I would say that the accusation that somebody is too rational, if you really look at it in the end, it just amounts to saying that they're not rational because they're approaching a problem in the wrong way. So no, I don't think you could ever be too rational. So we can't think of everything, that's the finitude part. We can't even think of everything that might be relevant, that's the finitude part. It doesn't matter how many people you have in the seminar room, they still can't think of everything that's relevant, not in finite periods of time, because we don't know in many cases what is relevant. And so the scoping problem is unsolvable in real time, okay? So we're subject to that restriction. We're also subject to the fallibility restriction. The fallibility restriction means that I might be mistaken about almost anything that I believe. Uh, and that, now that can be helped a little bit by the fact that there are eight or 10 or 12 people around the table looking at the beaker because they're, again, they're not all going to be fallible in the same way. They're not all going to have the same blind spot. They're not all going to have the same inhibitions about, uh, they're not going to all have the same commitments to some uh, uh, previous notion of how th the world works that in, in fact is unhelpful in this case. So, so the fallibility part is a little easier to recover from mm -hmm. than the finitude part. And the finitude part is the, the one that we really have a lot of trouble as a species accepting. Uh, I think, scientists find themselves asking philosophical questions all the time. I mean, they're not necessarily the questions that they're answering when they're at their lab bench, getting measurements, when they're writing up their journal articles, but what gets a psychologist into psychology? What gets a neuroscientist into a neuroscience? are big questions about understanding the mind, understanding consciousness. Now, in practice, almost everyone finds themselves working a lot of the time on narrow more narrowly delimited questions. But for most scientists, those big questions in the background don't go away. And any amount of, any number of times I've had, you know, conversations with a scientist, say in a bar or at the end of the day after a conference, they have philosophical views, which are as strong as those of any philosopher, which vary just as much as those of any philosopher, and which often turn out to be really motivating them 
in doing the kind of scientific research that they're doing. And sometimes it's actually useful, I think, for the philosopher to come along and talking to a, talk to a scientist about the philosophical assumptions that underlie their research. What are the premises of this whole research project? What do you think it's ultimately going to explain? I think there's often very rich philosophical views that inform uh, the science here. And I think there's been, a, I've had many rich interactions with scientists myself where I think both I've learned a lot uh, from the science, which can help me as a philosopher and which hopefully a scientist has learned a certain amount um, of thinking about philosophy, which might help them as a scientist. I think there, there are really obvious ways in which those two disciplines can come together. And I think, you know, in cognitive neuroscience, we could, can benefit uh, enormously from a, a kind of philosophical stance on problems. So often, when you're focused on empirical issues, it's very much the here and now. And really, what we need from philosophy is people to come in and say, well, you know, what are the broader implications of what you're saying? Um, is it logical to uh, attribute, for example, a perceptual state to a particular part of the brain? You know, one of the techniques I use is, is brain imaging, functional brain mm -hmm. imaging. And what we tend to do is fall into a trap where we will say, uh, we've had a person with their brain scanned looking at um, a, a visual stimulus like a face. This part of the brain was active when the person perceived the face. Therefore, this part of the brain must be the face processor. It's a very localizationist kind mm -hmm. of approach. And while that might be true, maybe it's not true. And often it takes somebody who's stepped back from the problem to say, well, you know, is it necessarily the case that every part of the brain has a localized function and that by simply showing people categories of stimuli, you'll be able to sort of identify each of those functions and piece them together into a, into a jigsaw. Mm. So I, I, th I think taking that sort of critical philosophical stance is really important for mm. um, empiricists and hopefully there's some flow the other way around. Hopefully people who are collecting data are providing good material for philosophers to be contemplating and thinking about.